I don't know why. Now, why this came up, I have no idea. <laughs> but I, I have no idea. But I, I was, ta- I don't know, was I talking to Deacon? Deacon's my middle son, um, who is 17. And we were talking about something. <laughs> And we were talking about Bishop Montgomery, and I was talking about the Sally Brothers. <laughs> and remember, it was like our Tom. It was like our junior yeah. the senior year, and yeah. like it, like like it was like the Hatfields and McCoys, like like the Willings and the in the in the Sallys went yeah. at it in a in a basketball game, right? You're hundred yeah. percent correct. Is that right? <laughs> yes. I, remember, I don't know why in the hell that came up. You know, do you guys have that? It's we like, might have had that on the podcast. <laughs> you have random shit like come up in your head. You're like, oh, remember that? <laughs> so are you, are you listening to the podcast on your bike or what are you doing? Uh, I, I haven't listened on to my bike, but I did listen to Mr. Rick Zepeda. I have to say that. That's for yeah, sure. He's so Look, funny. The Sally story is it, it, it just keeps getting better, man. It's it's always it's five times better every couple of years. Yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, and, 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 Willis, yeah. and Sally's exactly. came from Samoa. Yeah, my mom knocks somebody out, all kinds of shit. You know? so, That's awesome. The funny, the funny thing about that is, is, is that my good buddy, Ed Acuna, who coached with me for years, and, and I, you know, we're godfathers to our kids and stuff, and uh, and uh, he works in the in the industry. He's a carpenter. He builds sets. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so he's out there at Paramount one day, and they they went and did, uh, what was the Mel Gibson movie, uh, the, the Army movie that he did? Yeah. Uh, they went on, they that's went a on, good one. They went on. They went on site for for months and and filmed. Uh-huh. And the Sally brothers when we were soldiers. Tradition. So those guys, yeah, we were soldiers. So they're, they're they they go and pick up my buddy to take him to the set, and it's like freaking. There's the Sally brothers no driving, driving the vans. So they had this whole freaking thing going on. Edmund calls me, "Hey man, what the fuck? What are you doing? <laughs> freaking having dinner? What, what's going on?" He's like, "I got freaking new and Ken Sally sitting here." I'm like, where the fuck are you? So he goes on. He goes on to tell us <laughs> the whole story. That's so classic. I love yeah, it. it's so funny. It's uh, you know, the, it, it, the interesting part about it was is after all that shit went down, and it happened over the course of like three years, because yeah. there was this big fight at St. Paul or at uh, Bishop Montgomery when my, my brother Matt and Greg were playing, and then the last fight we had was when Greg was playing his senior year, and that whole thing was just insane. But um. Matt went to SC mm-hmm. and some of the, the Samoan guys okay. came up to him at one point and said, Hey, um, we just wanted to let you know that we were sending our respects. You guys fought the Sallies, fought a fair fight. Those guys, fight. Uh, no big deal. Wanted to let you know that there was no problems uh, that we were going to have. Any Okay, welcome Out Loud Nation. We're here with Jim Toth. Um, He's a a big player in the entertainment world. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that as somebody that I grew up with as a young man, Jim came from um, the Equipa area, the Pittsburgh area. He came to St. Paul as a freshman. He's a he's a new kid on the block. Him and I were both kind of we came to school and didn't know anybody. We didn't know any of the other kids and we played football and we became buddies. Uh, And then Jim went off to college. And we, I went off to college and everybody went off to college and, you know, we didn't see each other for a long, long time. And, you know, it's so funny because he just went to the West side and you would think that, you know, at LMU and you would think that he was on the other side of the the country, but he, you know, he's just, we just never made it over there. And uh, so Jim became a stockbroker or worked in the financial sector. uh, And that was kind of a thing at that time. You know, every, it was all about wall street. Greed is good. You know, everybody's wearing suspenders and all that jazz and, you know, at least half of the boys, at least 25 percent to 50 percent of the men, young men at St. Paul High School wanted to be stockbrokers at that time. And Jim did it. And I'm not sure it's exactly stockbroking, but he was in the, in the financial area and sort of uh-huh. and sort of made some money and sort of like didn't like it, you know, and, and then just decided he's going to walk the earth for a little while, like 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 Kane and, and, and search out his 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 passion. And uh, and Hollywood came calling and. Jim decided to go to CAA, might as well start at the top, you know, just go right to the best place, which is what he did when he came to St. Paul, I'm guessing. And uh, that worked for him. So he did it again and went to CAA. And um, the story, as I know it, was he started out as a mailboy and just kind of delivered the mail and had the pulse of the whole building and saw people coming and going and played his cards super cool and, and parlayed that into a 
parlay that into a, a personal assistant job for one of the heavy hitters at, at the at the CAA. And again, CAA is a place where they're taking care of actors and taking care of athletes and taking care of everybody. Basically, agency, right? An agency, and and uh, and at some point, you know, Jim was going across the world in G6s and, and helping this guy out and come to find out maybe they weren't going to, they weren't so happy with Robert Downey Jr. And Robert Downey Jr. was got himself into trouble and Robert got himself in, got himself a, a little uh, stay at the Hilton there at the County Hilton. And uh, I think they were going to drop him and, and, and Jim in his, you know, there's one of those turning points in, in everyone's life that we're trying to highlight here. It, it, he sort of stepped in and said, wait a minute, now talent is talent. You know, this guy is a, I don't, I'm not sure he was a cat. Did he win an Academy Award for Chaplin or he was nominated for Chaplin? He's nominated. He's, he's nominated for Chaplin, but the guy, everyone knows he's talent plus. So Jim said, Hey, why don't I take over this guy? Let's not, let's not drop him. Let me, uh, I'm going to say babysitting and that's not the right word, but let me take care of this guy. Let's make sure he gets where he needs to get to. I'll be there when he wakes up and I'll put him to bed at night and, and we'll see what happens. And, uh, before you knew it, that relationship grew into Iron Man and Sherlock Holmes. And before you know it, the guy that you know as Robert Downey Jr. is not the same guy we knew as Robert Downey Jr. back in the day. And um, that level of sophistication and that level of service uh, granted uh, Jim some other clients you know, and we'll, we'll just have to get the name dropping out of the way the the Matthew McConaughey's of the world and the Scarlett Johansson's and the Jamie Foxx and Chris Evans and Selma Hayek. I mean, she still hasn't come to my birthday yet, brother, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Zoe Deschanel. And uh, you know, here's the funny part is the speed round. Selma Hayek's going to make another appearance. So get ready okay. for that. Neil Patrick Harris. So what ends up happening is, is Jim is going to be in his second career is going to become you know, really at the top of the pyramid. And, and, um, and that has opened a bunch of doors for him to do the things that he loves to do now um, in the entrepreneur area and in the, in the giving and the donating and the, and the foundations and things like that was what we're, what we're really going to highlight. And, and along the way somewhere, he met a nice young lady named Reese Witherspoon and, and they have been together for a minute. So now that all the name droppings out of the way, Jim, tell me what are the sources of your success? What, what, what allowed you or what taught you to correct, get where you're getting correct a little bit first and then, I, and then we'll get into that. So I, that, that's all pretty, fairly, pretty accurate. You know, <laughs> it, it's fairly accurate. Fairly I, accurate. I, I will say, you know, I graduated Loyola Marymount. I had, I guess this goes to, this will start to answer your question, but when I graduated in 92, I had one, two, three, for five jobs damn between 92 and november of 95 before i started ca hmm. um and uh and i distinctly remember a turning point for for me and and how i got there and i can get to that I'll, I'll go back to that but but then i started at ca in, in november of 95 i started off as a trainee, trainees do start in the mailroom. <laughs> we'll call the mailroom. I'm in the mailroom. I was just talking this morning because we were talking about the sort of the phenomenon of people not wanting to go back to work post COVID because they're making more money. And, you know, yeah. which raises the question. It, it, it raises the debate, right? Is minimum wage too low or, you know, whatever. So <laughs> I said this morning, just this, just this morning, I started off at CAA making $4 and 25 cents an hour. Attaboy. Um, which is a true story. It was, that was minimum wage. Um, I worked at the Montebello town center. My first job was $3 and 35 cents an hour. Chess King or what was it? Chess I was King. At, I was at Ico international <laughs> before I worked my way up to the gap. The gap, um, baby. Yeah, man. And, you, you, you seem like a banana Republic type of guy, but nah, gap's cool. Nah, nah. Gap's cool. Like the gap, you know, I couldn't get into one of the other places, but man, it was, mall that was a pretty good mall back in the day yeah um but anyway i i started at ca and uh and and went from the mailroom to becoming an assistant there which is basically a secretary uh, basically it's secretary and and worked my way up i got promoted after four years and <clears throat> i had a pretty good run um the, the first thing i did as an agent is i represented uh, i i actually went into the new media department i was promoted in 2000 and this will all go back to the answer to your question, but I was promoted in 2000 to be a new media agent. So that was really the onset of the dot-com boom. Mm. And 
oddly, I sat at home, a really good buddy of mine, I'm godfather to his kids, gave me a VCR or a DVD player for, for Christmas. And I spent all Christmas watching movies and watching like director's commentary and so forth, kind of going, well, what, what is it that I want to do? What do I want to do? And it was kind of like right in front of my face, literally, right? But I was like, <laughs> what do you want to do? Well, you know, and so I ended up uh, as a, uh, a new media agent and, and that, that was obviously a bust and that turned into me being in the marketing department. I was like, what in the hell am I doing? Ended up coming back to the talent department. CA represents, as you said, athletes, but writers, directors, actors, actresses. And uh, I was back in the talent department in the actors department. And uh, I realized through some of the work I did on the Coca-Cola account, Sprite liquid, liquid Mix Tour and whatnot that we didn't have hip hop clients. So I represented just about everybody in 90s hip hop you can imagine. <laughs> I was invited to be on the Ice Cube team. I represented Busta Rhymes, Missy Elliott, Method Man, and Red Man were my first two clients. I put together a movie called How High. For those of you that watch that, a lot. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> uh, uh, that great piece of art, which is actually held up, also put together the ill fated show. Uh, I remember back then we started talking about some of the, pro the problems that we had in Hollywood today that we're starting trying to address today. Like Meth and Red would say, like, dude, there's not one black dude on the show, one, not one black writer. Like, these, this is corny. This shit's yeah. corny. And, yeah. like, and, and and you know who would have thought that you're, you know we should have addressed that then and we did you know, you know we didn't as an industry i should say um and then really the first movie star i signed was matthew um oh, okay uh i sort of in a weird move at the retreat everybody was i don't know i we were like who are you and what can you do and what do you think your thing's gonna be and i was like well i'm not the independent guy I, that there doesn't seem to be a lot of money in independent movies and then that doesn't <laughs> That doesn't, you know, I'm not the, the theater guy because I'm not a theater dude, but so I was like, I think I can represent a, I could sign a, you know, a first dollar gross participant movie star, you know, and everybody's like, yeah, okay. And I thought about it. Sure, sure. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, who do I know? And I knew some people that were connected to McConaughey and I saw, ended up signing Matthew. I just pretended I was his agent. Literally in every meeting, I was like, I'm his agent. And, um, and signed him. Downey was not a client. He was uh, he uh, of the agency. He had previously been a client of my mentor back in the day. Um, I kind of was angling around because I I uh, he had he had been I think about six seven eight months sober I believe at that point. You know, notably had his struggles, and um, my mentor came in my house and said, why, "Why is Downey calling and why is he asking about you?" I said, "He's my favorite actor." And he's like, well, I'm not doing this again. And, right. uh, and I said, okay, well, okay, but we did. And we did it. And uh, I signed him and became his agent. And Iron Man happened and, and, and you know, so forth and so on. So I, I, that was pretty accurate, Tom. <laughs> but, you know, it has but, to be dramatic for the kids in, in class, you know. <laughs> I had to correct there. But, yeah, I, had, I feel very grateful to have, uh, to have had that run as an agent. And I think I always knew. Um, in my heart of hearts that I was going to, that's so funny, a Twitter thing came up, said Robert Downey shared something on Twitter. Oh, no. I'm not, oh, no. Um, I'm not on Twitter. Um, emergency, I, emergency. Jim, what was it like going from the financial world into that world? Because it seems to be, you know, I'm sure a lot in common, but a lot polar opposite, you know, in, in some sense. Yeah, but, a lot of polar opposites, a lot of, a lot of guys in the, I mean, man, you know, if you it, there's a movie Boiler Room, which was exactly like what I was at a Sherson Lehman office, and it was kind of like that. Right. We had, I mean, it was pretty crazy. It was like that movie. There were just a lot of guys. I knew I wasn't that dude. I'll tell you, when I was a, when I was a, the difference I can encapsulate in one thing is that I remember Kirk, Kirk Cobain died. It came out, you know, he he had killed himself, and it came out over the over the box. And I remember dudes were like, "Fuck that guy." You know, and I was like, wait a minute. I was profoundly like hurt, you know, because I like he had meant a lot to me as an artist. And 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 so I felt a little like a square peg in a round hole. Um, I grew up broke. Uh, 
I believe to this day I was the 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 the, the poorest of of my group of really rich friends at St. Paul High School. Oh, wait a minute now, Norwalk. Come and, on, and, Pico and, Rivera. Come on. You know, <laughs> I don't know how many times they had to rip off my scooter in my apartment building. But you know, the same guy kept ripping the shit off. The same guy. <laughs> I'll put a I'll put a picture of him up there. Yeah, exactly. And um, but I have to say, like um. You know, I wanted to make money, but I, I I knew at that point that I didn't want to talk about money all day long, you know, money and money for money's sake and money's sake. I also realized and recognized, Chuck, that, uh, you know, when I would go to some of my buddies, I, you'd get off at one o'clock. And for me, that was just kind of a recipe to, you know, we just all fucked off, you know what I mean? Yeah. We'd all like, go drink beer, smoke some weed, do whatever. And, um, and, and, you know, it wasn't very productive necessarily <laughs> getting off at one, you know? Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> I, I remember going over to my buddy's houses and they'd have a bunch of financial magazines and barons and whatnot laying around. And I was like an MTV dude. Yeah. And, and so, uh, anyway, that it was a different, it was, a, it was a, a change that I knew I wanted to get to. Tom, you said, I don't know how you phrased it, but the source of success is that was that the question well here's what happens jim is every time we bring somebody on that we just absolutely adore they come on and and sort of the idea is you are you are a pinnacle in, in one way or another whether it's your character whether it's your business acumen whether it's all of those things and nobody wants to talk about it everybody's like oh i don't want to be humble i'm going to be humble you know oh shucks you know we don't really i i think that we're trying to let you know chuck and i both coach in high school sure. this is going to hit some young people maybe and we just what what are the sources of your success? Like, where does that strength come from to walk away from one thing and to walk into to the place and pretend that you're his, you know, where do you get the balls to pretend that you're Robert Downey Jr.'s agent? And where does that, is that from your dad? Is that from Midwest? Is that from Alequ St. Alequ Paul High School? Aliquippa, Tom. Aliquippa. Yeah, the toughest I, I, place I in America. Up, I was born in Pittsburgh, just so you know. So, <laughs> yeah, I was totally, yeah. My, I was born, my dad lived in Squirrel Hill and, you he know, did? Mom lived in Mount Lebanon, and yeah, they the rest is history. So I had no idea. That's yeah, crazy. so so the, uh, the the boy from Aliquippa, you know, showing up in, in, in some of the scenes that you were seemed to be in, and you know, that's yeah. that's, a, that's a jump. You know, that's really yeah, look. I, I, I'll elaborate. You know, something my my wife and I just talked about recently. You know, because you know her parents different. Her dad was a doctor, her mom uh, a, a nurse, and and but but like the drive. It, a young age she's been working since she was 14 you know and, right. and and so we we talked about that just recently like what what was it you know i didn't i don't know all i could tell you is that um um i remember reading the lee iacocca book uh when i was a young kid i remember reading it it, it wasn't political with that in that point in time part of the deal or what deal. it was not <laughs> is not a political statement that is just a fact that i read it when it came out um i always my dad would always be like i remember one of the a really bad fight we got into once about we got into a fight i used to be in the i used to like watches i had a friend that had a watch had a his dad was a bookie long 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 thing about my one of my oldest friends end up going to harvard but uh play football and uh he but Milan, his name's Milan Kasanovic, nice Serbian kid. He, uh, Milan had a, his dad, he, in like sixth grade, had like a, like solid gold Rolex president, right? And, and I remember I always like loved that watch. I was like, I'm going to get a watch. And I would like get the magazine. I got the magazine from Rolex when I was in high school. And my dad's like, what are you, what the fuck are you looking at those watches for? The watch tells time, yeah. you know, like, and I was like, no, nah, man, only time it's worth something. And, and it was just like, we were like at odds with each other. Like I was just built differently. Um, for whatever reason, um, I just felt like I, would, I wasn't willing to settle. Mm -hmm. I had a few things that, that happened. I mean, I came back freshman year. I got <laughs> my freshman year at Loyola Marymount. This will bring some anecdotes into my freshman year at Loyola. <laughs> I came home every weekend and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, Tony Johnson and I would drive back and Toyota truck and we would, 
we'd drive back and I would go do my thing. He'd go to home to La Mirada. And I, uh, I probably shouldn't say my, my buddy's names because, but I was arrested with a couple people you guys know. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I, and I was like, oh, shit, what am I doing here? You know, if my kids are listening, I was in Arizona at the time. I, it was, yeah, not me. It was <laughs> but it you know, and, and I was like, Oh no, man, what am I doing? You know? Yeah. And, and so the next semester I kind of bought all in, but I'll tell you who really pushed me away. And, 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 and in retro, and at the time I was like, really like, fuck you. But, but in a, in a very loving way, um, you know, Rick and I used to go uh, up to that water tower up there in Whittier. Yep. And it was Rick, Miguel. The curvature of the earth. Louis, Louis Harmio and uh, Raul Zepeda. And Raul, Raul Duardo, we, we interviewed him as well. And he, he said to me, you're, you're, you're going to get out of here. You're going to get out of here and do fucking different shit. You're not coming back here. You're going to fucking leave and da 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 And it was in my face. I mean, and like, you know, that wasn't a dude I wanted in my face. You know what I mean? I was happy when he showed up if somebody was going to jump us at a Whittier High School party. <laughs> Ra- this was Raw or Rick? Raw. Oh, wow. it- yeah, he's a big son of a gun. <laughs> yeah, I was like, in my face, you know, and we were drinking and everything. I was like, oh, man, this dude's going to fucking kill me. And uh, but But I think he pushed me away in a loving way in an interesting way mm-hmm. like, and said, you got to go to, I, I heard it differently at the time. Um, but as a professional, I had all those jobs. I'll never forget. Once things started going well for me, my father said to me, man, I was really worried about you there for a while, kid. And I was like, you were? And, and I guess that made sense empirically. Yeah. That would, that would not be it. But I was always like, Oh, I got to, I, I I remember some, you know, it was like what, maybe the 94 uh, Bulls or one of those teams before I started today. So I'm assuming it was 90, maybe it was 95 Bulls. But I was sitting there watching the finals and um, I was thinking to myself, those guys aren't, they don't look like they have a job, right? They don't have a job. They're playing basketball, <laughs> right? And I'm not a pro basketball player, but there's got to be something out there that I'm good at, that I'm the best at, that's not like a job. And I'm willing to sacrifice and put in all the hard work and miss out on other things, just like those guys have, right? Every singer, every dancer, right? Every ballet dancer, whatever you talk right. to, people that, that make it are successful. And I was willing to put in the work. I just didn't know where to go. And um, I, uh, you know, the, the, the how and why CAA is a whole other story, but I, I, I was determined to not settle until I felt that feeling. And why did I you, Jim, why did you guys come out to California? We tell, moved- tell me about that. Cause I, I think there's some tie in there. Like you guys, cause just so yeah. you guys know, like Jim and his dad were in California, nobody else was in California and they were together. And then you had a ton of independence. You know, your, your apartment was a place where we can go, you know, like it was a, it was a bachelor yeah, pad. Like if I wasn't there, you guys show up. You guys yeah. Would... Yeah. We had the key under the mat, you know, like that deal. It was awesome. Yeah, under the grill. Yeah. Yeah. Remember? The grill. That's right. It was like, a, yeah. You know, um, my mom was actually here, you know, I, look, my mom and I have since had, have a, a lovely, uh, a great relationship. Okay. You know, in high school, it was strained. Um, right. We moved out. My mom, my dad, and I, I'm an only child. My mom, my dad, and I moved out in 1984, June 1st of 84. Uh, I landed on the, the rock that is Whittier, California. <laughs> and, you know, by, by summer of 85, my mom and dad were splitting up. Okay. And then I lived with my dad. And we were, like I said, like my, my dad had a, we didn't, we couldn't even afford a car. My dad had a motorcycle and we would go shopping on Sunday nights. We'd take the motorcycle, drive down to my mom's apartment, borrow her car, go to Alpha Beta, come <laughs> back up, like drop the groceries off, go back down to her place, get the car or get the motorcycle and drive back home. And then like a following year, my dad met uh, my, they, he was never remarried, but, but I would call her my stepmother. Lynn, um, who my dad was with for 23 years before he passed away, 
Um, and, and they started dating, but, you know, and he was sort of misguided and we made peace with that decision later on in life. We talked about it, but he, he stayed at her house all the time. That's right. Why, how my house ended up being like the place to go, because there was like zero to 3% chance you'd see somebody, right. You'd see an adult. <laughs> from like it, was, it was pretty cool it was pretty cool it was cool then i mean you know now that i have kids i'm like wow that was really fucked up how do you do that but you know it, see it, i think that all ties in jim i think that's part of the sauce you know i think that's the ingredients i don't know sure i think you know i you know done a lot of work on myself through the years and i've had ups and downs and struggles uh you know like everybody else and uh a lot of them i think were were sort of abandonment issues and so forth and and well, let me pitch let me pitch this to you bro yeah. so i think that you have to have that i think that that you have to have some sort of you know scar in your past that helps you be relentless with your with the rest of your life or with your with your relationships or with your your business or whatever the case may be I, i'm very keen on that because i i work with kids for the last 30 years and i see soft kids kids that don't have to make their bed and I, I just don't know how they're going to survive, you know, and now those those kids are coming back and, you know, protesting or doing whatever the hell they're doing that, you know, this entitlement or whatever. We didn't have that entitlement. You've mentioned being poor twice. You know, Chuck had six boys in his house. I mean, they were fighting over the milk. I mean, we're, we're all sitting here going, yeah, we had a hard upbringing. It wasn't Xbox and bicycles and and, you know, uh, new shoes. It was all of these little sacrifices that we had to do as young people that our parents had to do. And now we become tough men. I yeah. think that's the key is a toughness, right? Yeah. You, know, you, you came across the country. You came from a place genetically that was, that was tough. You came to another place. You thought it was La La Land and you landed in Whittier. That's another tough place. And then we all, you know, you almost get pushed off the, the water tower and um, to your death. And, uh, you know, and that's how you got your life together. I mean, it seems pretty, pretty easy to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, you know, I, 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 I think that a lot. I, I, I will say that um, our kids don't have that upbringing. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's scary um, to me. It's scary to me, Jim. It scares yeah, me. And, I, and, and we talk about it, right? You know, and we talk about it openly with them and yeah. um, about, I think that's all you can do. Um, and you can't pretend that we've worked very hard uh, individually and as a couple um, to have the life that I feel very grateful and very blessed to, to have and to lead. Um, statistically, it wasn't Im improbable. It was actually probably really impossible. I talked to anybody from Pittsburgh who says, like who is from Pittsburgh, like, oh, if, they, if people say, oh, uh, where are you from? I say, originally I'm from Pittsburgh and they'll go, Oh, well, I'm from Squirrel Hill. I'm like, Oh, you understand Pittsburgh. So I'm from Aliquippa. And they're like, Whoa, that's like, you know, that's like a weird, like that's, you know, Aliquippa is wrought with a lot of troubles. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so we talk to the kids about that, try to share those stories, try to impart that a value system in them. I mean, look, we're going to live our life, right? We're not going to apologize for the life that we have. Right. And, and there are a lot of things that, that we get to do, but they don't do that on their own and they have to, there are rules and, and this is not, they are keenly aware. You can ask my daughter, uh, who's 20, almost 22. Um, she goes to Berkeley. She's a junior. Um, you can ask Ava, you know, and she knows, you know, in a year's time, you know, time to work. Or if you don't want to go to school, you know, Deacon's got a, a myriad of opportunities in front of him, whether it's school or making music professionally and any and all of all those things. And um, he, you know, like, all right, well, if you're not going to school, the money, the, the, the money's yeah. so you got to have to figure that out right you know? like we're not going to pay your way uh, and um i think you have to have hard and fast rules and i think that's difficult i've seen a lot of people you know who have been given just enough right such that they don't do shit yeah and what do they say it's it's our money it's not your money right is that what they say to the kids 
<laughs> I've heard somebody's famous said that. That's that's my money. I don't know what your money is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> uh, I feel blessed that we have very uh, kind, responsible, uh, driven kids. Um, um, because you can do the best you can, but they're also individuals because they all turn out different, right? They're, do, they're, do they respond to those stories of dad's mm-hmm. life and, and grandpa's life and this whole other life? Yeah. Because I, I always complain. I always have this theory, right? But my wife came from a middle-class upbringing and she's absolutely spectacular. Your wife came from a middle-class. She's absolutely spectacular. But here we are like, you know, these guys on the, on the low end thinking that that's the only way to go. And yet, people are successful from every walk. Of one of the things, one of the things that's really amazing is, is that, you know, the communication is such a key, yeah. you know, I mean, you can talk about anything and, and you can create an atmosphere where people will understand the perspective, you know, and that's to the kids that I think that's the answer is, is, you know, yeah, yeah. Kid, kids, there are kids from, from all walks of life that are successful and failures. And, and a lot of it seems to be the, the, you know, the examples and the communication that their parents give them, you know, and, I know you from from all I've read about you, Jim, is, is that you, you have a reputation of being a hardworking dude who is always getting after it. And I know Reese has the same kind of reputation in the in the world that, that you know, at least we see as being an unbelievable hard worker and, and somebody that is, uh, you know, committed to that. So you're you're obviously fine examples. And, and I, I applaud you for that. That's a big deal. Thank you for saying that, Chuck. I appreciate that. And, 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 and truly, I do. And and I think that you know, nobody can never take the work away from you, right? That's, that's the bottom line. And, and it turns out parenting is a lot of work. <laughs> and, 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 and so you got to show up, you know, you have to show up, you have to be present. I've had times where, you know, I'm, that I'm not my most proud of that I wasn't showing up and I had to get better. Um, and my wife called me out on that, you know what I mean? And, nice. and you know, I was consumed in, in my own shit and I had, generational family ways of coping with them you know and and which was drinking frankly I mean I don't have a problem talking about but that you know I mean that was that's that's how you know (laughs) that's how I think generations of both my mother's and father's side of the family dealt with anything it was just by you know drinking you know oh shit got a problem drink about it so (laughs) drink about it (laughs) you know what I mean everything was drink about it and next thing I know I'm drinking and drinking and drinking and drinking and my wife's kind of like what the fuck are you doing like you know and and that's just not fucking wino yeah (laughs) you can't be be present yeah well you know you're there but you're not present you can you know and and you know I actually stopped drinking about two and a half years ago actually a little over two and a half years ago and and that's the single most uh, profound. profound decision, you know, of, of anything that I've been able to accomplish in my life. That has been a big one. Um, in many regards, you know, obviously I was old enough to learn that that wasn't right, but you know, I had to understand, come to understand that it wasn't right, and that that just wasn't okay and and that I was being self-destructive and then I had I wanted a life and was able to get a big life and I had a big career and I can manage it and then I had a family that it was like right. holding on for fucking dear life and then I was like what are you doing <laughs> and, and really it's like well, what are you what are you doing you know what I'm, was the what was the demon that popped up when you stopped doing alcohol like what was the first thing that like oh shit I gotta fix this part I think it was just a, a, a disappointment in myself. Oh, wow. Like, you know, what, what, like, wow, you know, you let a lot of people down. Like I'm letting my, I'm letting my wife down. I'm letting my kids down. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I didn't like, I think as alcoholics go, I, I have what you call very high bottom. <laughs> my, my bottom was very high, fortunately. Right, right um but have you come to that conclusion jim are you an alcoholic and yeah yeah. did you do 12 chuck and i both worked in a drug rehab for young people and uh just so just always an interesting question is that something you work through the 12 steps or not not at all uh i worked with a guy who was uh like a sober coach that that rolled with me for a couple yeah yeah And, and he was like uh we'd like drive around and we, we were talking he's he's a really good friend of mine now right um i was ready though do you know what i'm saying right like, on yeah I, I was ready so 
like I think he would tell you that his job wasn't particularly difficult because I was <laughs> to do it. I was, uh, I was trying to get the principal of my school to like have a 12 step class at school as an elective. Cause I feel, <laughs> I feel like, and for no reason, not for, not for addiction, but just like, these are pretty good steps, like to be a pretty decent yeah, human being. Yeah. If you just wanted to work I went, I went, I would, I'd say about, about like a 12 step program. I, I went to, uh, I, I was very, um, you know, uh, was doing it in a very private way. Sure. Um, but I, it was, you know, invited to go to a particular group and I went to that group and, and, and definitely earned my seat at the table there. Right on, right on. Uh, totally earned my seat there. I, I, after a few months, I really didn't feel like I was benefiting. Like I felt like I, it was more like I was serving a hollow penance, like, okay, I'm going to be here. And I, I wasn't getting a lot out of it. I didn't get a lot out of feelings like you know what man like we're all full of shit and i'm like i'm not full of shit i just drink too much wine you know what i yeah, mean like, yeah. but <laughs> you know well, you know they they say and i've, I've had i've had friends that have gone through the whole deal and they say that you know that that's a sign of of healing you know that what you're talking about because you know you're not then addicted to the process you know and that's a right you yeah, I, didn't, the I didn't feel like i felt like i had an issue i understand it you ask me a question am i an alcoholic yeah i am um, do I identify with, is that one of the first things that comes up with my head? No. Right. Um, about who I am. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, it's not first in my list of attributes and I never thought it was going to be part of my narrative. I'll never forget. I was sitting with, uh, somebody who I respect, who I worked, work, uh, worked with, um, recently. And we're sitting across and he was like, yeah, we were, we were talking about something. He was like, yeah, you know what? So what? You had a problem. You fucking dealt with it. And I was like, oh my, all I could hear the whole rest. I couldn't hear another word. He said the rest of the breakfast. I was like, <laughs> and then I got in the car and I knew that I was on my way to healing. Cause I was like, I, my initial reaction was like, wow, I never thought that was going to be part of my narrative. Right. And then I thought, well, I never thought like losing my dad before he ever met my wife and children was going right. to be part of my narrative either. That's right. And so like, we have very, we have very similar past like that. Jim. Like, balls, right. And yeah. you, like, you didn't expect that. Oh, sure. yeah. No, I didn't know that I was going to be that guy. You know right. what I mean? We see it in sports all the time. Right. I mean, yeah. Chris Weber didn't think he was going to be the guy that fucking called time out. That <laughs> you're going to play it forever. Replay. Every, I, I know that I know that I'm you know that guy. really I'm that guy that's your narrative that's your story what are you going to do with it though right this is just a chapter it's just a chapter that's right <laughs> my my uh my family comes from Cleveland so I guess apparently we're mortal enemies because the Browns and the Steelers are mortal enemies so yeah. uh Cleveland versus uh Pittsburgh is a big deal but they're also my entire family has issues with alcohol and uh you know but it was something that I had been removed from I didn't I never met my dad but I did have a lot of step dads so my mom got married a number of times i have five step dads so you can do the math on that but um one of the things that bothered me and i really want to hit this because you have everybody can rewind the tape and they can listen and i heard it and it makes me feel so happy and so proud of you as a father but i was never called son in my entire life i was always stepson grandson nephew you know, I, I don't even remember a coach. You know how some coaches pull the sun card. I don't even think I ever got the sun card by anybody. Um, and that was a huge deal for me. I had five fucking guys that could have embraced me and all the success that I had at St. Paul in high school and going to call being the first person to go to college and, you know, being a semi normal guy. And, and to your point, I don't I never was a drinker. You always remember that I was always the designated driver guy. And it was just in the back of my mind that there could be a genetic thing. And I didn't want to go down that Gordon path. It was so well lit in Cleveland, mm -hmm. but I made it very, very, it's a, it's a lock stock rule in my house that no one's a stepson and no one is a stepdaughter and no one, that's some bullshit. Cause somebody should have claimed me, you know, when I was getting a fucking 3.9 and I was all league, somebody should have fucking claimed me and they didn't. And Chuck did and coach Romero did, but that was about it. So we don't say that. So I have a son that, belong is not biological that belongs to my wife and he belongs to me now too and the minute we were together he was my son and when i talk to people this is my son and my wife i have a son different from my wife and she calls my you know my son kyle loves colleen like like from the jump and 
I, you know, I was waiting, you know, I always wait and hear people. I want to see, did Jim say stepson? Cause you do have two non-biological kids. You do have two stepchildren, yeah. but never have I heard you say those words. And it, it just resonates with me, man. It just makes my heart full that you, you know, have taken on that responsibility in whatever you have been allowed to do. And I want, I want to talk about that. Like, what is, how does that work for you? How does, how do you guys, first of all, you're a Hollywood family. Second of all, their dad's a Hollywood, uh, an actor, your wife's an actor, you're in the business. It's like, this is like a perfect storm to your point earlier that it should never have worked out. How do you guys do the dad kid? How's that relationship work at your house? Well, first of all, it's a great question. And first Thank of you. all, I'm it was sorry. 10 minutes though. Or that you had that, that, that experience, you know, I mean, you're right. You're right. Um, uh, somebody, you know, and, and, and that goes, those are the, those again, are those the things that the yeah. wounds that drive you, right. Um, Love it. To do what you do. Um, uh, for us, God, when I met, I had never dated anybody that had kids before I dated my wife and, and, and I obviously I knew she had kids cause you know, <laughs> I knew her life and I, I, I knew her, her ex-husband was and um, and uh, uh, I actually had a therapist and I was like I don't know what the fuck, like, the fuck to do we're dating and I, I, I'm a little confused and he said well your mom and dad were divorced and they didn't handle it right right I said yeah 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 and it was really simple he goes well, what what would you have done differently just do that that's so uh, awesome that's so that's awesome. pretty simple. I could do that, you yeah. know? So I, I'll never forget where I was, uh, you know, when my wife and I were at lunch and um, I actually, t I asked for her, for Ryan's number, her, his number. And I texted him, said, I'd love to get together with you. And um, he was like hundred percent, man, you know, and we, we got together, we hit it off. I said, look, you know, at that, at that time, I was spending a lot of time around the kids and I said, I would want to know, yeah who this dude is, you know, me as an agent in Hollywood and I know you and but I owe you that respect. And so you can feel, have a comfort level, ask me what you want being around your kids, uh, around your children. I respect my kids do have a biological father. I've never tried to say I'm your father. He's not your father. Ryan is their father. And, right. and, and I, um, I tried to make it additive um, if I can be there as another, as a third adult, nice in their lives, a third parent in their lives, then great, right? Because a you know a stool you know can stand a little more firmly with with yeah. three legs than two, right? right? So, so God knows parenting's hard. There's enough work to go around. So I think that we've done um, our work together as a unit. To, make sure that the kids understand that everything about, you know, how we, 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 I think, you know, there, there are, you know, obviously Ryan runs his household the way he runs his household. We run our household the way we run our household. It's not like we're in each other's business like that. But I think when it comes to the kids, there's a, like an expectation that the kids, you know, fall into a particular um, set of values. And, nice. you know, Ryan's from Delaware and he's from a, very working class, you know, that help, huh? Uh, you know, sort of upbringing and background, although, and, and after, you know, from a very young age as well. Um, he and Reese were very young when they got married, very mm -hmm. young. You know? Um, and, um, I think that's how you've done it. As far as the kids go, um, yeah, I don't, I don't treat them any different. I don't talk about them any differently. They're not, treated in my estate any differently <laughs> you know, i got three kids and that's just the way it is you know i mean do you have to do you have to draw the line or does everything fall to reese when they're at your house something goes wrong do you get to be a heavy do you have to oh, yeah. enforce the rules or do you have to go go see your mom yeah yeah hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah my house all right right on right yeah, on hell yeah um um and, uh, and it's great to, you know, they were, you know, they were 10 and eight when I met them, they're 22 and, or 21 and 17, soon to be 21, 22 and 18. Right. It's just crazy, um, to me. Um, but, uh, I'm very proud of them. They're great, 
uh, great kids, great people, great humans. Um, they've had a pretty crazy life, you know. Um, you know, Ava was one of the first kids, really, back in the you know in the late '90s. That she was born in '99, but she was one. Of, you know, there are like people jumping over, you know, paparazzi jumping over like fences at their preschool and shit. Like, right. You know, and it was, you know, that's not easy. Um, How do you deal with those things? How do you talk? What, what's the conversation about that? that? It's weird. And that's just weird. I, I get you know, They were already conditioned. They, we, Ava and Deacon would laugh at me at 10 and six. And I was what, 40. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't even see these cats. They would be around the floor. Like, He's right there. Like, you know what I mean? Like they didn't do. And I guess, you know. <laughs> Tennessee, like snipers. You know, weird. I mean, it's, that's it's it's a big reason why we don't live in LA anymore. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, um, that's Wait, let me sh- let me shift gears a little bit, if if you if you mind, um, or if you don't mind. Um, yeah. You know, you're talking a little bit about the business and and all the the aspects that affect a, a normal normal, if you will, will a normal lifestyle. Um, it's one thing to be one of the biggest agents in in Hollywood, um, which is on a grand scale. Um, a lot of people know who you are, you're out there, so you're being scrutinized. But then to be with somebody who is also a big star and is scrutinized like that, um, we, norm, people like us don't, I don't understand it. I know I can, I can logically, you know, think about it, but I just don't understand how do you cope with that on a daily basis and still remain somewhat grounded? I mean, that just seems like such a big challenge. It- at first, it's really, I had a real challenge with it. Um, dudes falling, I'm not, I'm not prone to road rage, never was. But then I start to get fucking mad at these dudes. I'd be like, you know, driving crazy, you know, I'd bring like a Gatorade bottle and spray them with water. And she was like, could you please not do that? Because like, it makes them come on me worse when you're not around. And, um, <laughs> you know, so it went from that. Uh to kind of like they're just there um it's annoying I, it doesn't ever get not annoying you're like <laughs> trying to walk to breakfast you know what i mean like you know or i'm trying to go to ice cream with my kid i'm not trying to like smile uh you know or or not smile i don't smile i'm happy but now you're making me not happy and now i'm like you know it, it it's it's uh a nuisance but i think <clears throat> it must be i don't know i think it's you just get conditioned to it because nobody's can i certainly didn't know that i was a you know i was around nobody people in the business knew who i, I what you know what i yeah. did did for a living who are what my position in at, at my job was but it wasn't until i was with somebody where it was like whoa well if it makes you feel any better jim if it makes you feel any better i don't think it's going to but you understand that the paparazzi is what put us back together. So the story, the, the, the true story of this deal was, was there's probably, a, I would say a 15 year gap. I'm not sure if you stay in contact with Rick or anybody, but I feel like there was a 15 year gap with all of us where we were kind of all doing our things, young professionals or doing whatever. And Robin Olin, who's a, who's a St. Paul girl that we all went to school with. She texted me a picture of you in like us weekly or people magazine, like holding hands with Reese. And it's like, Reese's new boyfriend. And, you know, and she sent it to me and I'm like, yeah, that's Jim. Like what? And I literally went on CAA website and found your email and I sent you an email and said, Hey dude, I don't know if you remember me. I, I, you know, I remember that day. And you called me within five minutes, Jim. That was what the baddest part. I, I, whole said, I, I think I've said it to my wife. If I've said it once, I've said it 20 times. <laughs> the only good thing about any of that was the fact that I got reconnected with my old buddies from high school. Yeah, man. Because yeah. it's not like a matter of like, uh, you know, you, you, you know, oh, don't you guys find this man when you're like, you know, you get married and you have kids and then you're like, you're fucking busy and you're doing this and that. I've, one of my great friends from college, a guy named Wayne Seligson. And I love Wayne dearly. And Wayne's got, he's got four kids now, man. He's got, he just had a new, a new baby. Right. And like, you know, he's got, Oh, like I, I think a one year now a newborn a three year old you know <laughs> ninth grade thing he's in it you know and he yeah. was in Hermosa Beach he's in Hermosa Beach and I was just in you know West LA and uh, right. you know 
life, you know? So, so, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at. It can, you know, life can drift you apart, but right. so if there was any positive, it, it really, <laughs> really was a, a cool and good thing. Um, a hundred percent. I feel the same way. We would have, um, we would have figured it out sooner or later. <laughs> you know, get it, it, there's nothing that gets, you know, the, the thing, the person who, you know, that bears the real brunt of that is my wife, just because like, I go out like here, it's great, yeah. but I could go out, you know, in LA and nobody gives a fuck. Right. But like she, when, you, like when you guys go shopping, this, even in Nashville, does she still get like, people coming up to everyone just leaves her alone is she southern girl and that's it and respect or and it's not it's not fans that are the nuisance it's gotcha gotcha random dudes following you all day every day you know that's a great distinction that's a great that's like you know when she's out like that's like wherever we live in la it's like their park right there yeah as far as you have as much privacy as your gate and then you know but she goes and it's it's in, it's incessant all day, every day. And, you know, she has nine days out of 10, eight days out of 10. She's at peace with it. And two days out of 10, it's like, it's normal. The, the thing about it, it kind of, it kind of becomes like a Looney Tune uh, commercial or, or cartoon. <laughs> because uh, remember when like Wile E. Coyote would go like, and he he'd check in, and there'd be the sheepdog, and there'd be Wiley Coyote, and they'd go in, and they'd go at each other. And at the end, it's he see you later, Larry. See you later. Yeah. Lunchbox. It, see you yeah. later. Because the way it works, I don't really know exactly how it works, but like the same dudes are there with you. So like the same guys are kind of there. So they respect sort of a protocol. Like they'll get the shots, and then you're like, dude. I think you got it. How many? Like, <laughs> hey, dog, and I ain't gonna change clothes for you. Yeah. So, like, what are you wearing? You know, got it. I'm wearing the Gap. <laughs> you know, it's like ridiculous. You're like, what is this dance? And, and then they go. It's when this, like, it's weird. It's a weird dynamic. Like, I can't explain it. Like, you, if we were fishermen, right, and we would go fish, we wouldn't tell and we caught we caught fish every day there you wouldn't go tell anybody would you you'd stay no. there and be like, i'm gonna make more money right fishing here this whole by myself well they call each other sometimes and then like they like two turns to 20. Can you like, aren't you diluting the value i don't know maybe the, I, I don't make, it really doesn't make any sense it make any journalism sense. so uh it, well it just and, it, and it just goes to show how how <clears throat> how much their business is profitable in that sense, you know, I mean, if, if, it, if they all can make money, I mean, it's, it's just adapting to the situation. It sounds yeah. like. What you're, what you're I think saying. social media has actually d- like taken a lot of value out of it though. I think do people want to see celebrities? Um, do they want like a real peek behind the scenes of what their lives are really like? Or do they want like these weird shots of people? Trader like- Joe's. Going, yeah, going to Starbucks. Like, you actually get a, a, more, a, a better glimpse into somebody's life by social media, and that takes a lot of the pressure off. So, I have seen it dial back through the years, too. Yeah, that's cool. I certainly tell you from the late 90s to social media, it's gone down considerably. Well, I want to transition, Jim, into uh, the concept of ego. I've been I've been studying a lot of stoicism and stuff like that, and I've been trying to get my shit together a little bit. And, uh, you know, the ego is the enemy and all that kind of jazz. And Chuck Willick has been that guy from the jump. You know, every time we've coached together, there's always a check your ego at the door concept. And, you know, one one voice, you know, sort of, you know, clear eyes, full hearts kind of idea where it's not about me or not about you. It's about us. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. I mean, I know Matt would be dying right now. Matt's literally throwing his iPod right now. But um, you are in a world of massive ego as far as i'm concerned in fact some of the things that you even kind of describe are some you know like i kind of mentioned big balls the other a minute ago and like where does the ego begin and where does it end and how do you survive because you you know it is very very true and i think people are getting that from you that you are you know a blue collar guy originally and, and that you still have those roots and how do you swim in that ego ocean yeah, and what's the tr- what's the trick? You know, I mean, yeah, what's, what's the, the trick, trick, man? <laughs> well, I don't know. Look, I I think I I too have have been uh, 
different therapist told me once that, you know, the, you know, the, we talked about, I, 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 I dealt with a lot for years before I did anything about it. Uh, uh, the inverse relationship that ego and self-esteem have, right? Mm, nice. The, the, Please high, say more. The more ego, the lower the self-esteem and the more self-esteem, the lower the ego, right? Nice. Um, so um, I, I think that, um, so I, I, I believe that, that that is something that always has stuck with me. And I, it, it, you know, I, I, I really never, you know, even in the, when I was in that world, because I'm really not in that world now, I, do, I, I sort of invest in that world and we have companies in that world, but I'm not living it day in and day out by, by choice. I, I, my time doing that is over and I had <laughs> a great run, but I don't want to miss it at all. Uh, I don't have any problem with it and I don't like to fuck that. I, I just like, like I'm done. You know what I mean? I was yeah, just yeah. done. Um, but I never had like this thing where like my friends, like, like my, my, my close group of friends that, that I rode with are all from college. Mm. Um, and none of those people really gave a shit about ever like what I did. They wanted me to be successful, but they didn't really fucking care. Right. And none of my closest friends on the planet are in the entertainment business mm. at all. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with it. So who you surround yourself with. So I didn't like, you know, I definitely like, you know, you, you can feel yourself, you know, <laughs> Uh, but I think it's like, is, is that the, is that your, is that where you function from? Right. I just mean, I just mean, stereotypically, there's yeah. people that fuck you. You're the fucking male guy. Fuck you. Go get me some coffee, you bitch. You know, get, get out of my fucking face. You know, like I'm a, don't you know who I, you know, that I'm a freaking Academy Award winner. Like what the fuck, you know, like. I think. Gosh, I and all I could say, Jim, is that there's those is, guys yeah. in football too, right? There's I those coaches. Said this. I always said this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the God's honest truth. Any of those fucking dudes, I was like, you know, those cats were fucking nerds anyway. I attracted to them for the first time in their life because what they did, <laughs> and that was it. Right. Period. End of story. That's and cool. I was like, I've been to the dance before. I was cool before this. <laughs> <laughs> So but I got the prom pictures to prove it, right? I didn't, much, <laughs> I didn't put much credence into that. I never was like, oh, now I'm cool. I felt I'm not really. I'm talking about how did you survive it? Like, how did you survive people putting their ego really onto well. you? Yeah. I guess by looking at them and, you know, those people and kind of being able to see that where they were functioning from, you know, it took a long time, a long time. I couldn't get out of my own head. Right. You know, I right. think in my twenties and my thirties, I was just like, uh, somebody said something about this recently and I couldn't, I don't know if it was an artist that was talking about it or what. And I, I, I was relating to it as a professional, right. Because I was trying to be this person and I'd see like, Oh, like this guy's a, I want to be like that guy. And I'm going to like talk like that guy. I'm going to be like that guy. I want to do like that guy. And I'm like, mm, but I'm I not want that, that watch. You know what I mean? I'm not that guy. And, and, and it's like, oh, and then I started to get more comfortable, right? And go, oh, I'm more comfortable with myself. And oh, this is my style, right? And it borrows from a lot of other people's styles, right? Like a, like a musical artist, right? right. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, interviews that um, uh, with Chris Martin uh, is, is that, you know, Chris Martin was like, everybody's saying that we're trying to be the cure. He's like, of course we're buying and tr trying to be the cure. Isn't everybody? Yeah. <laughs> Robert like, Smith, baby. <laughs> Why is the cure? Uh, you know? And, 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 and so I think that people, so I was probably so can, I was maybe so self-conscious that I wasn't really aware of maybe a lot of the other stuff around me. And it was such a big world, right? It was such a big magnanimous world of like people. And, you know, there was always an interesting room of people. And, and that I felt like, you know, I think my, my, my thing as opposed to dealing with others' egos was more like trying to be like, 
how do I find my comfort level? You know right. what I mean? And as, as I progress, and I, I believe most people do, hopefully the quest in life is to get more comfortable and centered in right. your own shoes, right? And in your own skin and go, this is who I am really, right? And you can do that at it, 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 48 years old and quit drinking and get more, even more comfortable in your own skin. Mm. There's levels of it, right? And and so, uh, you know, in the day that stops, then you're not then you're not growing, and then you're not interesting. So I, think I wonder. I wonder if that's attractive. I wonder if you have all these nerds that and all these people that have these self esteem issues because I love that inverse proportion thing. I wonder if they were drawn to you because you were chill and you were working. If you weren't there yet, you were working with a good true north, and if and you. And you were chill and you weren't getting all caught up in all the bullshit and you weren't drama. You know, you weren't a drama guy. You were just, hey, man. Uh, look, I'm, I, I, look, I've had my moments of fucking drama. That's for God. <laughs> I'm trying uh, to yeah, give you a compliment, uh, sir. I don't know. There's everybody, one of my mentors used to say, we're all a little broken, which is why we're here in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Right. So it is a little bit of Island of Misfit toys. So the broken the, toys. I just claim that I'm, I was mellow yellow for uh, a 25 year stint of a day in and day as a day in and day out executive in Hollywood is, would be inaccurate. <laughs> print that and underline it. And yeah. anybody listening to this, that's true. I know a that lot I of people really had my moments, but I, I always feel blessed to have been able to have some kind of true North that mm-hmm. took me to a, a, a more centered place. Whittier, I, Whittier, I true north. Whether I was there in, in any given moment, no, I wasn't. <laughs> I mean, you, because you know, we talked when we first connected again. We talked about again. I don't want to name drop, but we talked about you going on vacation with a very, very important star. You know, a very, very important. You know, and so how do you go from that world of you know, sort of the talent to the world of friendship? You know, it seems it seems like there'd be a lot of walls to break down. Now, that gentleman, and I'm just going to say his name, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, is a pretty yeah. damn chill dude in the first place. Yeah. It wasn't a lot to work on. Hey, how's it going, bud? <laughs> we we have a really um, we have a really good relationship. Yeah. We uh, we're friends um, uh, and 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 our friends. Um, I, I feel lucky to count Matthew as a friend. So I think that was a different relationship. And, okay, and we. And we, we've never been like hang out every day, friends. You know what I mean? Uh, right. But but that friendship and respect evolved, and he's a he's a a, a down to earth dude, and 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 pretty fun to be around, as you can imagine. Um, he's, he's as advertised. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we had a lot of good times. Um, there would be other clients, is is, is you know right. But, look, I was always happy being like you know. I, I love my dentist. I think he's great. I don't want to fucking go on vacation with him. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. What was what was the what was the hardest thing about the job? I mean, in terms of you know keeping those guys happy and and what was what was the what were the the, the one two three of of how you approached you know the day to day work of it all? Yeah, I think you know I, there's a there's a, a gentleman by the name of Ron Meyer who was one of the founders of CAA and. And Ron said something very early on that resonated with me and uh, in, 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 in our circles, it was, he, he'd spoken, you know, he, he was, been at, he was at Universal forever. Uh, right. Just left the, the, the business day in and day out, uh, I think a year or so ago, but Ronnie said, you know, he didn't even graduate high school. Uh, <laughs> and Ron always said, you know, it's a very simple business. I, I return, uh, I return every call and I do what I say I'm going to do on all those calls. And if I don't know the answer to a question, I say, I don't know, but I'll find out and I'll get back to you. Like, and it was really like, Oh, you know, and, and, and I, you know, and I have the good fortune uh, 
to have the opportunity to to speak to younger people, I always say, boy, if you could just not be a flake, unfortunately for mankind, you were <laughs> to, to to rise to the top quickly. Um, if you just do what you say you're going to do, and if you return every phone call, he he would return every phone call, and 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 he had these great ways too of like doing it. You know, he'd be like if you knew somebody was like going to talk for a long time, you know, you know, he'd say, Hey, I'm glad I got you. I'm about ready to step into a meeting, but I didn't, nice. I didn't want to not get back to you. I got like three minutes and, it, and the person felt like, Oh, he actually, he cared so much to get back to me. He, he's in a rush, but, I, and then he, but he was getting off the call right as soon as he was getting on the call, which yeah. was kind of genius. You know what I mean? Right. So, he, he was efficient that way. He didn't shit chat it up with everybody. And I, and so that's how, that was how I, those, those basic blocking and tackling sort of fundamentals were as an agent were there. You have to learn how to trust your taste. Um, it's a mm. business. There's no right or wrong. You guys, uh, you know, the three of us could watch a movie separately and we'll have three different takes on a movie. So likewise, when you're reading a script, as you're recommending it, you, you know, it's your ability to articulate it and you have to develop your taste and prove that you have a certain taste over a period of time and trusting those instincts is, is something that, that matters. Um, so certainly listening to that voice and honing that voice over, over time was a good thing. And just believing, you know, believing in, in, a, in a client and saying, no, you're wrong. This person's right for it. Or saying right. to the client, "You're wrong. I promise you, this is you." Or, "This is this isn't. You gotta you gotta stop at three before you get to four. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, all of those things were, you know, the ability to. I would tell. I would speak very frankly with clients, um, with honesty, because I didn't feel like anybody would benefit from me. Right. I don't want to be afraid of them because when agents agent out of fear, I think that that is a disservice to the client. And then the agent starts to then get fired because Jim, Jim, say that again for my students. Say the honesty thing again. That's very, very important. Please. Yeah. You gotta be, you gotta be honest. If you're not honest and, 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 and have the hard conversations with people, then, then people are, will, will not grow. So nice. Um, if, and, and that is the truth. You know, I know you're trying hard. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not good enough right now. So nice. let's see how, how maybe you're working too hard. Let's figure out a way to work smarter. You know, mm. how, how can we, how can we do that? And, and so I enjoyed that part of it. I mean, being an agent is very fulfilling and rewarding, or I found it to be fulfilling and rewarding because it is, and it could be the same thing that is maddening. Like many things it's, you know, the two edged sword is, <laughs> is like, what is so rewarding is that you work with these wonderfully minded people. And what's difficult is that you're working with people who are artists. I mean, yeah. these people are, you know, these people are, are not by accident. These people are on purpose and by design. And um, you don't just become one of these big players like that. They, they right. have a lot of talent and their minds work, not like the, the, the maybe the person that's wearing the suit every day, right? <laughs> you have to relate there, you know, and, right. and find your way in. And that I found to be a cool challenge, you know? I thought I want to, I want to ask you. Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to, I want to ask one more just, to, you know, so the nuts and bullets, I love the tackling and blocking concept. So in my, I have a very similar relationship in that no one, with maybe Chuck Willig, maybe a couple guys, no one believed that me and Colleen should have gotten married. No one believed that we would still be together. It was, you know, she had a child. I had a child. We, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there are so many things about her that make me better. You mm -hmm. know, she, you know, she's punk rock. She's unconditional love. She loves me really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Like in, you know, punch my face, love me kind of not, not, you know, legitimately, but like she just, you know, she, you know, with going through cancer and things like that. I mean, she was way stronger than anything I can be. Yeah. And, and, you know, silly things like, you know, she makes a little bit more money than me. And that's really comforting to me. Like, I'm not sure if I made a bunch of money, if I wouldn't be a tyrant around the house, you know, where's my chicken pot pie woman, you know, why is the house isn't clean, you know, like I'm in check, like everything's yes. Yeah. You know, everything is okay. Yeah. We're 50, 50. Everything's good. We want to go to this show. We want to go to that show. 
-hmm. What you are in a situation where you have an uber talented wife. And I'm not just talking about, hey, the kid can act and she you know, looks good on camera. But this this young lady is, is doing things that are gender. She's a giant making things better for women, making things better, opening opportunities in business, uh, opportunities on, in, on, on the big screen and the small screen, mm -hmm. completely fearless. Yeah. Where do you, how do you guys balance it out? Like, how do you not just become overshadowed and how do you not become just, you know, like fall back on the red carpet? I mean, listen, bro, there was some pictures of you where you were hiding on the red carpet and now you're standing there by her side. And I, and I just, you know what, Jim, if, so you happy. Answer this, if you answer this with just saying, you're just badass. That'd be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, we can cut this. Fellas. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, yeah. How do you balance it? I mean, because uh, I think look, you got your hands full, brother. Truth be told. Um, yeah. I mean, that's a bit, you know. What does she like about you? I find myself in a lot of relationships that, um, you know, for sure. I mean, first of all, like I, like I was saying, I, 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 I certainly did not find myself um, dating people who were uh i dated some wonderful people um but 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 um i, I don't think I, I i felt challenged or i don't in many ways and and uh then i got challenged in ways that i would have never imagined and in my life uh up until i met my wife and you know i lost my dad in april recent i met the following january and wow that time period was awful and i was i was in a bad way and i can elaborate but i was in it suffice to say i was in a bad way and 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 so i kind of came home and was i came home from i was in uh i was in london and then new york and then i came back home and it was like mid-december and it was like the the point where like everybody like it was like the last day of like work in december yeah shut it down and everybody was shutting down. I, I got home at night and I got up to this house and I had this like modern, cool house in the hills. And it was know, cool. There I was. And, and I'm like, I didn't have a plan to go anywhere. Everybody else was gone. Um, and that used to be like kind of how I felt as a kid, you know, like, uh, cause I would like dip in and spend a few hours with my family on the holidays. And then I'd go back and be alone. You know what I mean? And the way I, I, I kept myself, um, you know, uh, humored um, from sort of high school to a degree and certainly college and thereafter was, was, you know, boozing and smoking yeah. weed, or, you know, hanging out. Um, it was nothing wildly insidious. It was just was what it was, you know, it was, and it was numbing. And, um, and, and I remember thinking to myself, if I don't do something, if I don't start to approach my personal life in the same way that I've approached my professional life, I'm going to end up alone with a lot of nice shit. You're right. And that wasn't the point of any of this. Um, and, um, and then, you know, and then we happen to go out on a date, you know, about a month later. Wow. Um, and so <laughs> holy moly, that's like the secret or something. There was like a lot of like yeah, there was a lot, you know, in retrospect, I guess there was a lot to it. I guess I never really the first time I, I had dinner with my wife, I, I I we had dinner, we had known each other a little bit, and um, and then we had this dinner. I had asked her out, we had dinner, and I talked to her and I was driving home and my friend Morgan is like my sister called me and said, Hey, how'd that go? And I was like, that's a wrap. Watch. I'll end up marrying her. And I knew, I just knew, you know, we had this really great conversation. I was raw and I think she was very um, sincere and I just had this feeling. Yeah. No games. And, and, um, and it wasn't about who she was. In fact, on the way to the date, I was like, this is the stupidest thing you've ever done. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, like, I thought we were trying to figure this out, you know, and now you're like an act, like this is so fucking complicated. Like this is dumb. Yeah. And people would say that you're replacing your dad with, with Reese, right? 
I was literally go have a nice meal and like, that's that. But I think it just always felt natural to be really honest with you. There's no real thing. It just felt very natural. I, I, I love my wife. It's very, sim- it's very simple. Um, she's the person I want to spend the most amount of my time with. Um, that's a good sign. And, um, and, 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 you know, I enjoy co-parenting with her. I enjoy our, our, our marriage, our relationship, you know, everything about it has been lovely and awesome. So yeah, she casts a big shadow and that, that, that was never going to be part of my narrative because I was always the central character in my narrative. <laughs> I, I remember I had a roommate in college. You guys will laugh, right? I was a big speed racer fan when I was a kid. And he, he was too, right? And he's like, I always thought I was Chim Chim. He's like, who the fuck, do you, who did you think you were? I said, I was Speed Racer, motherfucker. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> you Chim Chim? Like, I never, Sparky myself, and Chim Chim. I never saw myself as Chim Chim, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so, so I, I felt like, yeah, it goes back to your narrative. You don't know um, what your thing is going to be and so yeah i but i do have uh she and i equally i think she respects and understands i know that she respects and understands uh what my career was about what my accomplishments were i I am coming from a a place of strength i don't you know her 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 salaries are reported mine aren't you know right 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 Um, but you know so people you know but i've done on my own i've done better than i ever i made more money than i ever it's not all about money but i made more money than i ever could have imagined i've been able to do things uh for my family for my mom uh and, and for my family that i never would have ever uh, there were dreams come true. Uh, I, I've hit those milestones, you know, very early in my life in my thirties. Um, I, you know, I remember talking to my dad, like going like, can you just believe I just got this? Um, and he'd be like, ah. you know, I mean, it was, you know, so I, I, I've, I've been there at a certain point. It's kind of like, you know, very I, have a lot. Oh, I have a whole it's lot more. It isn't like how we roll, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, well, the complimenting each other, obviously, from the from right. what it sounds like, you know, is, is yeah. pretty fantastic. Jim, can we talk a little bit about your father and, and his, yeah. his situation? And I know that will lead us into some of the things that you're uh, that you're passionate about. And uh, yeah. I know that was a big part of uh, part of life. And uh, we, I think Tom and I both have a, a vested interest in in that whole narrative yeah. of, of what's going on. So, of course. Um, well, yeah, my dad. Look, my I think. I think my dad, uh, and, 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 and in no way is this like not my dad, not my mom. Um, so my, I think my dad would probably be, you know, Tommy, I was looking at, you know, you know, some of, some of the things we wanted to cover. And it was like, you know, who's been the most influential person in your life. And that's hard, right? Because a lot of people have been influential in my life. Yeah. But I have to say my dad probably was, um, and and in many ways, it's difficult to say, but it's true. In many ways, it's because well, I think he was responsible twice in life for, for giving me life twice in life for, from the onset, you know, obviously together with my mom, gave me actual life. And then I think when he passed away, I, I had a reset. And it started with the thing I just alluded to a bit earlier that I, yeah. alluded to, I just spoke to earlier. And, and, and then... Even in looking at myself, honestly, all I've been really been trying to do, and I haven't done it extremely well always, you know what I mean? Sometimes I, the desire to do be better was there, but the actual, I wasn't doing the work, um, you know, that's for sure. There have been those periods of times in my life. Um, and, um, but I think, in terms of kind of examples of what not to do. He's been a great influence in my life um, as well. And I'm not trying to disparage my father or give him a backhanded compliment, but it just was what it was. But but he was a straight shooter with me. Um, and he did instill some really solid values um, in me. And, and when he made mistakes like leaving me 
uh, as a kid in high school, kind of on my own. Um, How old were you at the time? 15. Okay. Um, you know, he, we talked about it later and, and he explained it and he didn't make an excuse. He explained why it wasn't an excuse. It was like, this is what my rationale was. And in retrospect, that was terrible rationale. And I remember him welling up a bit. We were at Hamburger Hamlet in, in Brentwood. And, and that wasn't his nature, to be completely honest with you. So, um, so he was very influential in that way. Um, I, you know, I, I, you know, just off the heels of Father's Day, right? And obviously I think about my father on Father's Day. Um, and, you know, I look back at when he got sick he got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. He had like a pain in his, in, in his, uh, in his back. And he kept going to our friend of ours, who's a chiropractor and eh, George can't fix my chiropractor. Right. He told me, he told me maybe I should go see a, uh, uh, a, uh, a pulmonary guy. So he went to see a pulmonary guy. The pulmonary guy took chest x-rays and I think he needed to see an oncologist. The oncologist was like diagnosed with stage four lung cancer inoperable and uh, you know he wanted to stay at Montebello uh, Oncology nothing against everybody out there at Montebello Oncology I didn't know a damn thing about cancer um, um, and I was scrambling I ended up getting him to City at Hope I couldn't get him to participate in the process he sort of went down very fast he got very depressed which is common for men to get very depressed upon diagnosis um, and, um, and eight months later he passed and that was that. And, 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 um, and so it was, yeah, it was a pretty difficult period of time because I think that I probably knew that I didn't, uh, I believe in the world I and mean, we all have our beliefs in higher powers. I have a lot of faith and beliefs. Um, but I, I, I believe that my dad somehow knows where I'm at today and is proud of the man that I'm trying to be, that I've evolved to and, and, and trust that I'll continue to evolve. But I was never in this world, in this life, that version. I was a pretty decent version, but I wasn't this. And, and, and so um, I think once I got a foothold, for myself in this, this next chapter of my life, because I think next chapters are good. You know, it would have been real easy to stay doing what I was doing, you know? Um, but I didn't want to do that. Um, in this next chapter of life, um, I would like to be that that's my, that is front and center for me. And, that's and you're involved in a lot of, and you're involved in a lot of, uh, of projects uh, in terms of supporting cancer research and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I, I've been really, you know, I have a great relationship with the folks at Stand Up to Cancer. Um, some really badass women started that, that organization. Lisa Paulson, Laura Ziskin, Sherry Lansing. Uh, you know, these are, these are, you know, and, 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 and I'm leaving other great women out and, and they are <laughs> amazing. Um, Women get shit done, and, <laughs> and 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 that organization has raised a lot of money. And what I really liked about it is that it was about research. I wanted to tackle research, um, um, and um, and it was about taking ego out of the research game to bring right. it back to ego. And, and I didn't realize, as you know, obviously not a doctor, but or a scientist, but the the ego about, like I wrote the paper, or I wrote the paper, and the credit, the fight for credit, has be has been a, an impediment to advancement across the board. And 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 so what stand up was doing was creating dream teams of people. In fact. A dream team that is on that that that, that works uh, under my father's grant were two people that were who were diametrically opposed, one at USC and one at Johns Hopkins, and they actually ended up becoming best friends when they took that stuff out of it, right? Nice, nice. And they disagree with it. 
and and then they came to like finding as opposed to like i'm right and you're right you're, you're wrong and i'm right like all that shit they actually were like well let's see what works and they had real conversations and um so there is the jim todd senior lab for innovative lung cancer research which is kind of funny because my old man would flip and i <laughs> that, that gives me joy uh, <laughs> Uh, the, I'm the, glad to see you worked on yourself in that area for sure. <laughs> a lot of joy, uh, like just the, his how irritated that would make him. But um, <laughs> got to do that. <laughs> in fact, my wife and I are executive producing the Stand Up to Cancer telethon on August, middle of August, I think the 16th, off the top of my head. So we're executive producing that telethon. We've, you know, we did events called, you know, Hollywood stands up. And then we did New York stands up. Um, right. We've raised a lot of money and, uh, and, and very proud of that work. And, and, and lung cancer gets a bad rap just because a lot of times it's like the smoking and yeah, you know, and, uh, my, and my brother Craig passed uh, at 40 years old and of lung cancer never smoked a day in his life. Is that right? Yeah. And, yeah. They, they said you got six months and six months later he passed away. So it's a, uh, you know, it's one of those, one of those kind of things, you know, and it's funny, you just said you're going to do the telethon on the 16th of August. That's my mother's birthday who also passed of, of cancer. So, wow. so it, it's all, <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a universal vibe in the, in the air and, and that's a, that's very cool. I believe in that shit. Yeah. I got sober. The first day of not drinking was December 13th. I did not plan it. December 12th was not a great day. Yeah. Uh, almost three years ago, right. but the 13th was the first day. And then afterwards I was like, that's my dad's birthday. Mm. Amazing. Wow. And I started wow. a job. Uh, I started uh, at Quibi, um, which was a big deal after not, after being somewhere for 23 and a half years and scary or whatever. And I started there uh, April 15th, which was the day he passed away. What? I'm yeah. telling you, there is the, the universe has a way so, of, got some of, strings. Of, of, of touching us, you know, in ways that we're not, <laughs> not necessarily ready for. I, I, I totally agree, right? I yeah. totally agree with that. What, what, tell us a little bit about Quibi, if you don't mind. I, mm, it's sure. um, such an interesting concept. And I know that, uh, uh, you know, that's Katzenberg's, was his baby? Is that, did he come to you with that? Or how'd that work? Yeah, I mean, I, Jeffrey's uh, still a great friend and, and has been a, a long friend of probably 15, 16 years. And, Reese made a movie with him as well, and they have their relationship. And and and, and a mentor is Jeffrey Katzenberg. You know, he's on the Mount yeah. Rushmore of you know he is. executives. Um, and um, you know, he didn't he didn't know that I was leaving. I was le I had made a decision to leave, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going to do one thing, and I decided it was just a different version of what I was going to be doing. But I was going to, and I had no clue what I was going to do. And I had breakfast scheduled with him. I went to breakfast. He's like, I got a crazy idea. And I was like, what do you got? He's like, you know, why don't you come, you know, with, work with me at Quibi and, you know, run content with me at Quibi? And I was like, no, dude. <laughs> like, I don't work for you. I don't work for anybody anymore, let alone you. You're nuts. Right. <laughs> you know, and he was like, you got to come work for me. And, and, and Jeffrey's persuasive, uh, to say the least. And, and he said, come, come meet Meg Whitman on, up at my house on this weekend. And I was like, wow, this is fascinating. Meg, you know, Jeffrey, big Democrat. Meg ran for governor as a Republican. I was like, this is like, I, I got to see this. <laughs> Obviously, she, you know, took eBay public. You know, she's a very accomplished person. I was like, I want to meet Meg Whitman. Uh, so I went up there and, you know, it was a, it was a very compelling pitch. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I ultimately think that uh, there was too much pressure put on the business. Jeffrey, only Jeffrey, and only the combination of Jeffrey and Meg could have raised $2 billion for a startup, right? Most startups are trying to be a billion dollar company. We, we, were, we were a $2 billion company before we launched. <laughs> uh, and I think that that put too much pressure on the business and didn't give us we didn't have the time that normal startups would have to mm -hmm. find their way. And I always felt that if we were successful, we would have found what the phenomenon that, that, that I felt in eighth grade or seventh grade that like I, we couldn't afford 
cable and, and but I wanted my MTV. You know what I mean? I wanted my MTV, like he wanted my MTV. And Doug, my Doug Herzog, great dude. And and he Doug's awesome. And Doug was an a, a executive at MTV and, and ran, you know, he put he 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 put the real world on the air. Doug Doug put John Stewart on the air when he was running uh, uh Comedy Central. And we Doug, I was saying that to Doug, God, our fucking we gotta be, I want our MTV. Can't be everything to everyone. And and Doug was like, yeah, you know, we're MTV. We like the like the working title for everything was like we'd laugh and call it I hate my parents because everybody, every kid would watch it. But <laughs> we had so much pressure financially on the business that we couldn't afford not to try to be something for everybody mm. to everything to a certain segment. And and I that's think I think that that's why it didn't work. Um, people certainly watch content on the phone. There's a lot of great content. There was a only Jeffrey from, I mean, the, the great part of Quibi is it was the first sort of organically technology uh, and entertainment company from the onset, right? So you had, you know, Tom Conrad, the head of product at Quibi, you know, built Pandora, you know, I mean, like you had like the, like, you know, dream team. Yeah. Just a crazy dream team across the board. And, and, um, you know, but I always knew it was either going to either, it wasn't like it was ever going to be like a single or a double. This was going to be a, like a home run or it was going to be a whiff. And it ended up being a whiff. Did, did, did COVID have playing at all or? I don't think so. That's my okay. fair, fair. Good for you. Yeah. I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. People have a, a, a lot of other things. Why wouldn't, you know, <laughs> you could say, Oh, it was meant to be on the go. Yeah. Um, and on the train, on the go. bus. Yeah. I don't know. Podcasts grew. Podcasts are typically when you're in your car and you're on the go. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, TikTok didn't suffer. You know, I, I, I think we missed. I appreciate I you being honest. Man. That's, fucking, that's okay. manly. Thing I'd say about Jeffrey, I think he's the, and I told him this. I said, you know, Jeffrey, Jeffrey goes big, man. Yeah, I mean, cool. he 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 willed this thing to happen. He, I, I promise you, he willed this thing to happen, and and it's incredible. And and he's a true entrepreneur, right? And entrepreneurs, you know, he didn't just like come into a big publicly traded company and miss you know um jeffrey you know you know obviously did what he did at you know at, 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 at disney and and then and created uh and created you know dreamworks and then dreamworks animation and then you know was big 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 on you know he had a, a company called pop.com which is part of the reason i wanted to be a new media agent that didn't work and he was always fascinated uh by these things. And he, 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 you know, if you're not failing as an entrepreneur, you're not trying. I mean, read any article about any entrepreneur. You're, 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 your failures are where you actually learn and learn a lot. So for me, the experience was phenomenal, right? Because I, first of all, I needed a change of scenery. I think everybody at CA would say he needed to change the scenery. We all need to. Oh, they're tired of each other, and that's normal. You were the scenery. 23 <laughs> after a half years, you know, you get like, okay, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I, at least I was, you know, I was sick of myself in that position. And, you know, and, it was interesting that you, you talked, you talked about uh, the badass women, uh, you know, in the cancer yeah. research area. And I know that you're involved in uh, um, some women's fashion, the lifestyle brands, uh, the Draper James and the Hello Sunshine stuff. Could, would you mind talking a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, you know, Draper James has been around. Gosh, I can't remember how long now. I actually shopped there when I was in Nashville. <laughs> not, not me, but my wife. You know, we went in there. Uh, that store there, that, that store does really well. Um, yeah, it does. We, it was our first venture together. And we, we it was like, you know, I want to more. Actually, she was really into Pinterest at the time. Pinterest was brand new. And she was finding like there were Southern women connecting and looking for a connectivity and the South had a, 
ha has this resurgence of music and culture and 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 food and I can, you know like America has kind of had this like return to regionalism right where it doesn't you don't have to go to the big city you can stay at your place so like right Billy Reed and and in uh, Birmingham Alabama and different things were going on and she's like I'm gonna start a blog and I was like okay the blog is gonna be wildly successful but like I don't understand like what the business around that blog is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like, what does that mean? You know, well, so like, eh, it's going to end up costing you money and you're a lightning rod in a good way. And you're going to attract a lot of viewership and she, yeah, it, and, and arguably we don't do this well enough still to this day, but I think we have great leadership at Draper James now with a woman named Erin Monik, who is the C, uh, CEO and um, who came on right in the middle of COVID, which is, you know, a Herculean task to keep the company afloat and just keep it going. But, but it, the point was to say, okay, let's have a business, but like t enrich the, the, the narrative of the story and tell the story of the South. But it's kind of like, you know, how Ralph Lauren showed you yes. the, the Northeast is or what that Hamptons lifestyle or that English countryside lifestyle is. Well, we were, our aim was to do that for the South. And like I said, I, I don't know that we've, retail's hard. And so getting, making clothes and selling clothes is hard enough. Telling stories, if we can get to the point where we're telling our story more, I think we'll, we'll be even better. But the, the business has been great and, and fun and interesting. And then and Reese talks about this all the time, and but it's truly her vision. Um, you know, the, and, and it's a, it, the Hello Sunshine is bred of her experience in, in the business where there weren't, as many great roles for as there were great actors, you know? And she was kind of like, well, I'm getting offered all this stuff that I don't want to do. This isn't good enough. And am I cold? And I'm like, no, you're not cold. I'm sitting in the meetings and you're getting the first offer. That's just what they're making. Yeah. He was like, well, that's man. Women are the ones that do this and women that see movies and this and that and the other thing. And they're only making this many movies. And I said, well, that could be white space. And you read more than anyone. And maybe, maybe you take that on. And so she self-financed a company called um, uh, Pacific Standard for I forget how many years. Um, very successful at the gate. Gone Girl, Wild. Um, actually, Big Little Lies started off at 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 at, uh, uh, at at Pacific Standard, and then you know, life in business is you know about you know good fortune as well. We 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 saw a need to do exactly what I said we were going to do. With, about with uh, Draper James to just tell our story more. So we have a third partner who's one of my best friends, a guy named Seth, third founding partner, I should say. And, and Seth and I were coming up with an idea of sort of a brand, a production company for brands to, for other brands to tell us, so like, well, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll be the case study, but then we'll do this for other brands too. Nice. And we're doing that separately. And we approached a strategic partner who said, I want to do it, but I want the film and television business as part and parcel of it, which we ended up doing. And it had this vision of female authorship. And then, you know, we were there and it was doing it. There's a great team over there. And then the Me Too movement happened. And all of a sudden, this company was here and got rocket. <laughs> it, it got like rocket fuel in it um, because it the mission was spot on mm -hmm. and we were there. We were the only ones there. There you go. The universe is making it happen again, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, awesome. so it's been a very, uh, it's very, very, very fun experience. It's um, yeah. the team there is wonderful. The team there is diverse. The, the company is big. We're blessed to have a very successful company and. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of my wife who's it's her vision and on our first date she told me she wanted she felt like her purpose in life was to be more than an actor and uh, nice. I, th I believe that this is that come visionary come to rest you know what I mean truly Jim well, I gotta I, I want to circle back Chuck real quick um I, I have to get this in so I I, I want to circle back to the cancer I, that was I'll, I'll fix this or whatever if I have to but um how, Jim, you're, I, I believe you're on the inside. You're, you, you've told stories about how they, you're getting doctors together and things like that. How close are we? Because here's, here's my problem as a, just a Joe. As a Joe, from the day I was born, there's American Cancer Society. Yeah, I'm putting the quarters in. I'm doing all that stuff. 
for my entire life. I'm 50 years old and, um, and I just don't know if there's momentum. And, and what can you tell us about the, the momentum on finding a cure for cancer? Is there anything you can speak to that? Or are you as frustrated as everyone else? No, I, 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 get, I get frustrated too, but I, I think as best I could define, I think we're seeing advancements, right? In uh, immunotherapies and, 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 and whatnot. But I do think that the hard part of cancer, the, the most uh, maddening and insidious part of cancer is that cancers get, cancer gets lumped in together, right? But all Correct. cancer behaves differently. So unlike COVID where, you know, and we're seeing the frustration with variants. Well, I mean, again, I'm not an, I'm, 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 I'm not an oncologist, but I'm sure they would tell you that, yeah, okay, so that's frustrating. Imagine cancer now. Cancer's like got a gazillion more combinations and permutations, you know, and, and so that becomes the hard part. The thing that I do think that everything comes down to on, on a basic level, and I think that, that it's more and more prevalent and we hear it more and more, that I think everything from the common cold to susceptibility to uh, viruses like uh, COVID or to cancer is um, inflammation. And, and the, the more we can educate ourselves and, 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 and keep down the levels of inflammation, um, the better I think our bodies can handle these uh, these diseases. Um, and I, I believe that it all come, comes down to that. So I, I, I do think that there are advancements. I think that we're seeing them. Good. Um, early detection and all of these things. You know, th those things are simple, but if you're talking about like prostate cancer, I mean, God, I mean, it's, I, I have one of my best friends who's like, like a smart dude or whatever. And I had to like twist his arm. I'm like, what are you talking about, bro? Go get a fucking, go get a, go, go, go get, get your call. PSA. Like literally you get a shot. You don't remember. And you go home <laughs> and you're done. It's easy. And don't like, you know, but it's, you hear people's experiences and they don't, they ignore things. You know, I had a cousin who ignored a bunch of things. I think oh, God knows how long my dad's back hurt. You know right. what I mean? I have my, he was, aunt, tough. He was a tough guy. My aunt's 83 years old. My mom's sister is 83 years old. And during COVID, she was in the car and she's driving. She was in the car and she got home and she reached over in the glove compartment and hit something and came back. And she's like a, a super young 83, right? She's not like a feeble 83. And she shoot her to her rib. She's like, ah, shit. And so she thought she cracked her rib. Good thing she did that because they took a fucking thing to see if she had a cracked rib and they found spots. Mm. They found it. I get her in the UCLA. She, you know, great doctors, did everything cancer free last week, you know, nice. Operated, got it taken care of done. And, and so that that's it, you know, people, <clears throat> people fear the doctor, right. And people don't get checkups and, you know, and, and, and do all those things. But yeah, Tom, I, 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 I too get frustrated about it. <laughs> like a lot of money goes into it and, yeah. and Get for it. and the, there are advancements there but the advancement that we all want is oh you got cancer oh yeah you're good yeah take a pill get yeah. done take a pill do this you're good get the bumper sticker <laughs> yeah. well okay. listen i, I wanted to i sorry chuck i'm sorry listen i i'm either gonna do this in post or i'm gonna do this right now i, I just wanted to you know just for everybody out there um i'm not sure i could do it but I just wanted to thank you for everything you did for me, you know, whenever. Yeah, I can't do it. I'll, I'll do it in post. But it's like I just you you gave me. So when I, when I got diagnosed, I, you know, there was first of all, I wasn't in the right age bracket. So there wasn't any uh, there's no playbook for me. And I definitely need a plan and I can follow any plan. You know, I can I, as long as I, I know what the if there's a one percent chance to win the, the football game, I, I'm good on I'm, I'll, I'll be willing to work. And I didn't have anything. And, you know, you reached out and um, I talked to some people. <laughs> this is hard. Oh, it's it not hard for any reason. I just get fucking fired up. Yeah. Um, so 
Oh God. Um, you know, it, and I, I, I didn't um, gee whiz. Um, I was, I was thinking about this all day. That's the problem. Um, and, and you gave me some uh, light at the end of the tunnel. And, and I didn't go in that direction, but I, I found some, you know, I was able to work through my own insurance and stuff like that. But, you know, I was in contact with the guy at UCLA and, 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 and all that jazz. And it was because of you. And <laughs> holy moly, I wouldn't have been able to get through it that time. And yeah. you, you popped in, you know, you just made a phone call and, and it was huge. So I just want to thank you for, you know, reconnecting and, and making a, a couple of phone calls because then I could, I could bridge the gap to where I needed to get, you know, and, and, and I'm doing pretty good on my test now. And, you know, two more years, I'll be cancer free officially. I'll get the bumper sticker and the t-shirt and all that stuff. But if it wasn't for you, um, I think I would have went in a bad spot. So well, thanks, man. Well, Hey, um, oh god, sorry no. about that. That's very awkward. <laughs> Not awkward. Don't, sorry about that. <laughs> don't, don't apologize for being a human being, first of all. <laughs> um, um, and it's I'm humbled by it, a eh? and and um, and I'm ha- I was happy to. I, I, well, I wasn't happy to. I wasn't happy to have, <laughs> but I was happy to be able to. Right. Um and. You know, Tom, nothing, uh, I have this, this person I work with very closely. It's, she's one of the founders of Stand Up to Cancer. Her name's Lisa Paulson. And our, our fathers passed away on the same date, not the same, Jesus. Year, but the same date. And we feel very connected as a result. And um, I don't know how many, the thing that makes me kind of sick sometimes if I think about it is how many people, um, I, I, I call or, or, or I jump into these situations um, and, it, and, it, and, and I would like to make other people, the reason I spend my time doing it and, and the reason it matters to me is that if anybody can have a, a remotely better experience than the one that we had, um, I think that's my way. It's, I, I couldn't control anything. And you guys are probably control freaks too, because I, you know, knowing enough about you. Oh, gee, you know, yeah. Uh, and um, and when you're a control freak and you have no control, it is the most maddening time that at least I could experience, particularly with my father. And I couldn't get him to fall in. I had, I, thought I was fighting him and cancer. And I don't know who was more fucking stubborn. Um, but um. Well, I was going down a dark hole, Jim, with like, why me? You know, why, why was this happening to me? I, I'm a good guy. You know, why is this happening? Mm-hmm. And, and you were able to, you know, like, okay, focus on this. Let's focus on this. Okay. You know, and you shook me up and, you know, kind of grabbed me by the shoulders and, you know, kind of woke me up to get me out of that. You know, I, w- I wasn't able to think straight. You know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to think reasonably and, and normally because of that. And, and um, you know, so I, I appreciate it. I was like, okay, fuck, let's go, you know, around this, get off the mat and let's, you know, let's figure it out. And, you know, and we're boys and, you know, we play together and, you know, like, you know, all those cool fraternal, you know, situations, but, you know, and I had freaking, I had insurance for fuck's sake. Yeah. You know, I, I, I had an ability, I had a doctor, you know, like, I don't understand yeah. why we don't have that, you know, like, I don't, I don't understand how people do it without it. You know, like I, without a friend like you and without a little bit of insurance and without talking to somebody i mean i talked to somebody from stand up to cancer i can't remember the gal's name it might have been the one you mentioned but she was like she was like loving me you know like like a mom it was unbelievable you know man it's it's particularly for men that's a very common reaction uh it just is yeah um women are a lot stronger I, yes, no doubt. I, I was listening to an episode of Joe Rogan recently and <laughs> he, he was like, you know, you know, women are stronger because they just deal with childbirth. You know what I mean? Right. Like it was almost as if like men were like, I can't. <laughs> and women were like, I got it, idiot. You know what I mean? And, and, and I think that, that, that women tend to uh, 
not fall into this pattern, you know, I mean, and as much, you know, a lot of this too, Tom is, um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm buddies with Lance Armstrong and Lance, you know, I used to get mad about, look, Lance, you know, has done so much for the world of cancer and you talk, absolutely talk, talk about, uh, you know, in, in Livestrong, you know, and, and I, I, I was very frustrated on his behalf, like when the, and I understand it's hard to separate the two, um, but like the, the, the cycling stuff or whatever was, was, was damaging what they were doing. And people were trying to throw Stan, uh, Livestrong under the bus and what Livestrong really stood for being a resource for people who don't know, because I had resources, I had, I had money, but I didn't know what to do. And you're like, whoa, there's no play, like, where do I start, you know? Right how do I do this? And that's the, the, the really difficult thing with it. Um, I mean, I've come to the conclusion that it isn't a pill, you know, like I don't want to go through chemo. I don't want to do any of that shit. I did radiation. And I thought I was going to fucking kill me. You know, I look like a ghost, you know, and, and, you know, I did some of the other things and it was awful. It changed me as a person. And, you know, I I'm guessing that it's a, more global medical thing you know it's weight it's inflammation it's food we eat you know food as medicine it's all this shit and we can't put it all together we can't fucking be reasonable and and box it all up and say this is what you got to do not you or anybody else i'm just saying as a country we got no fucking chance you know unless unless we make some changes and get people off the hook i mean i i talked to kids that when i mean both chuck and i we, we coach football in the ghetto and those kids were coming to practice on hot Cheetos. You know, those kids were not eating breakfast and coming to practice without having food that day. You know, they were, they were, they were it was a food desert, as they call it, right? There you go, you know, we're over there in, in North Long Beach and there's not a place to eat. There's not a place to eat. I must have put on 10 pounds when I was a coach there because you just go grab something, you know, like this. I don't understand why we as a country are not a little bit more, um, like, why can't we understand that it's not one thing? You know, why can't we? Because I was always searching for that one thing, Jim. I was like, what was it? Was it one of my sins that I'm getting paid back for? Was it a cheeseburger that I'm getting paid back for? Was it something I said to somebody? Was it, you know, like, why is God doing this? All this jazz, right? I don't want to get too deep into it, but it's a whole nother podcast. But that's like, show. yeah, it's another show. But like, I don't, you know, well, I don't understand why we can't have health insurance. I don't understand why we can't have meals you know i work in a place where not everybody's down for the free lunch program you know i'm like well you wouldn't even eat the free lunch because it would be too low for you but you're gonna deny this to some other kids or whatever how are you supposed to learn you know so I don't, i'm sorry i'm sorry jim i don't mean to get involved in all that stuff but i i just i wanted to say that you know that it was crucial you know we we've been you know maybe i didn't we didn't start this podcast talking about connecting the dots and the universe and all that stuff but it's really sitting back now it's really become that you know the literally that day when you call me you know i was in my class ruminating you know you called me during class and you gave me some some options and i talked to somebody a couple of days later from stand up to cancer the biggest thing you know it was in the freaking world series that year you know the stand up to cancer things you know like and i was a part of that you know and, and you know i talked to somebody at ucla that you put me in contact with like i had some bullets in my gun you know and i it, it was really you know, ultimately, uh, I didn't have to shoot any of those bullets, but it's like you gave those to me. And I just think it's so generous, you know. Well, it's my, it, 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 yeah, again, uh, I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate and blessed to be able to, to, um, to have the resources. Um, it's the most, it's the most amazing thing, you know, that you can do. And there are people that, you know, I, I'm actually learning, <clears throat> having just moved, you know, not even a year ago, we've been coming here a long time, but, but we moved here full time less than a year ago. And I, I, I joined the board at uh, the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center and big time didn't realize what li literally like the, the, the region and, and this region is doing poorly. If you see cancer rates in the country, this region is, is, is really bad. And a lot of it is because of access, um, truly. 
to to proper health care and and and, and 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 regular checkups and, and so forth and so on and by the time things are caught it's too far down the line and 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 you you realize how um how impactful these organizations can be and how yeah. how, how how integral they are i i agree with you it, it does seem a little ridiculous that the, the part that really gets me and we can this is a whole other podcast but, <laughs> but, but, you know is the 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 pharmaceutical companies non-collaboration with each other right um and and, and i will say that the public health care systems in let's say like canada or you know if you talk to anybody that's in, are in those systems in Europe are, are pale in comparison to the system we have here. Uh, so I don't think personally, I don't, I don't think that that's right. I do think that there's a reason that thankfully, even in a conservative court, Obamacare was held up for the third time this week. Um, and we could get past that shit and get on to talking about some real stuff. Sometimes in this country, we get caught up in we're caught up in antiquated uh, debates. Abortion seems to be an antiquated debate. I mean, <laughs> you want to talk about morality and and shit that's going on in science. I mean, abortion's how old? I don't know. We could create a person in a tube right now. You could probably three right. D print a, a person, a baby, in a couple of years. And we ain't talking about the morality of that because it's not a political lightning rod. So what are we doing? And so a lot of that shit, like I get. I get worked up about that too. Um, I don't know anybody that hasn't been touched by cancer in one way or the other. That's the craziest part about this whole yeah. country. When I don't you, know one person. When you get tapped, it, it's like you, it's like you got like you got tapped to be a member of a club you never wanted to join. Yeah, that's how I look at it. Yeah. It just sucks. Well, the support the support that uh, that you know we we've all been able to experience is is one of the things that is for free. You know, and and, and again, and I don't mean without time and effort but uh, but that's that it makes a difference and those are the things that we can continue to share with each other you know right. beyond the things that we can control that or can't control and uh, and i know we're all greatly appreciative of uh <clears throat> you know of, again you share you guys sharing this time together and, and being able to talk about that and uh, jim that you spent all this time talking to us and and uh, about all these things it's been yeah. been really cool to you know, again, a guy from El Equipa, and uh, we get to spend a little bit of time and chat it up and uh, chopping it up like we did. It's it's really been cool. So I just well, to- I appreciate you guys uh, uh, inviting me to come on. It's great to connect. And uh, Chuck, you know, I don't know how long it's been since I've seen you, but yeah, no you know, well. a minute. Tommy G, it's great to talk to you. Um, I, I admire what you guys both do on behalf of kids. Um, um, I appreciate it. You know, it's uh. I think I remember Magic Johnson saying way back in the day, if we paid, if we paid uh, teachers like we paid athletes, we'd have the best teachers in the world. And and for those that do it, knowing that it's not, yeah, you know, you're not making <laughs> honest money uh, uh, to 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 work with kids um, and and to coach, which is so important. Um, yeah is um it, it is really admirable and and i admire what, what you guys are doing with the podcast and, and the subjects that you're that you're tackling and, and flattered to have been invited so thank you cool well let, let's lighten it up a little bit we have a few questions okay is that all right just yeah. we'll, it'll, we'll be done here in a minute it, it won't take yeah, long no, okay all right go for just it. just real quick so yeah. what you so we're gonna, what we do is we have a couple questions that we'll use for like you know compilations and then we'll do the speed round there might be some names you recognize in the speed round but uh anyhow uh, what's yes. your desert island records? Because this is this is cool. Let's I hear what you got to say. I have to pick how many. How many do I get to pick? Five. You get five. five? Don't give me don't give me none of that greatest hits crap either. No, you can mean. you can go double album if you want, but no double, you know, no greatest hits. I'd go, uh, <laughs> I'd go Bob Marley Kaya. I'd go Bob Dylan, Blood on the Tracks. Nice. Okay, hold don't say anything else. I'm gonna write down a I'm gonna write down a record right now. Don't say anything else. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm going to shock you with this one. The greatest pop album of all time is Purpose by Justin Bieber. So I'm going to take that with me because that's the greatest pop album of all time. Even better than Thriller. That's tough to say. That's what I thought was coming, Thriller. That's tough to say. (laughs) Purpose is a great album. Don't sleep on Bieber. Um, (laughs) 
Uh, man. Uh, God, I'd have to take. I God, I think I'd have to say I'd have to take Cube, America's Most Wanted. Oh, nice. And one more. I got one more. The one Boy. that I have written down. Oh, uh, I'd I'd take uh, oh easy uh, Seeger against the wind. Oh wow, good for you! All right, here's what I put. I don't know if you can see it. That is the most disparate group. Is it, tell me that you're gonna find somebody with a more disparate group of albums. <laughs> yeah, how about no. how about Del Sol, Three Feet oh, High and Rising? Three Feet High and Rising is a great album. Uh, see, <laughs> me and you listen to that thing for uh, the whole oh, summer straight. Man, and my mom's Fiero. Come oh, on, oh lord, good lord, <laughs> no. No, the uh, Suzuki Samurai, bro. Samurai, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got to say, so we just, I don't mean to mess up your night, Jim. We, uh, Jim brought us out to his house and it was awesome in that, that modern house that he said he, he, made, he had his dinner and treated us like champs. And we all talked about the old days. And just being the guy that I am, I'm like, dude, I got to see your car. Like, what car do you drive? You're a dude. You know, what car do you drive? And, you, and this is the greatest part of the story is you took me out and, and it was a Jeep. You know, a fucking Jeep Wrangler. It could have been anything. It could have been a freaking Ferrari. It could have been a Porsche. It could be, and it was a Jeep. And oh I, I was like, dang, Jim, you're freaking down to earth, bro. You know, like I, in my mind, I was saying that. I was like, this dude, he's remember the neighborhood. And then I'll go back and I go, and, and Rick Zapata goes, because he didn't come that day. But Rick Zapata goes, well, he did. Remember the Samurai? He's a Jeep guy. <laughs> like, oh like, the guy hates tops. He doesn't have any tops on his car. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, just real quick. Uh, and if, you, if you can't answer it, it's okay. We can edit it out. One person who made an impact on your life that doesn't know it. The key part is doesn't know it. You know it. Yeah, it's tough, right? You have to make a phone call tonight. Person who made an impact on my life that doesn't know it. <laughs> Fuck. Um. God, I've made such a point to tell people when they when they good. Do. Yeah, I'm that's a, the answer. That's I'm the answer. Talker. That's what Raul Gerardo said the same thing. He's like, I'm yeah, man. really did. You know what I mean? I'll be like, well, you fucking uh, <laughs> love you, bro. I don't know that I have one. It's okay. I feel like I've, I've You're been not going to say Coach Reddy or anything like that. Or... No. <laughs> Who's that? Snedeker? Was that my fuckers? Snedeker, name? it's in your eyes. Fire oh. in your eyes. <laughs> All right, well, let's skip it on. Let's skip on. That's okay. I love that. The idea that you, you know, I mean, I that I should be a point for anybody. They should be able to tell people what they feel like. Yeah. When they feel that way. Very yeah. good. Good call. What's the magic bullet for happiness? Uh, I think, I think getting comfortable in your own skin, you know, being honest with yourself. All right. Um, well, uh, it says if you had Bezos money, what would you spend it on to make your country and community stronger? I'm assuming it has a lot to do with stand up for cancer and, and the, yeah, and and the think, uh, Johns think, Hopkins and that. And it, w- it would definitely be, that but I, but I would I would take it probably a, a step further back. I think that 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 you know our our public education system for as wealthy as this country is is terrible, <laughs> and we right. do my bad. You guys won't like <laughs> this necessarily, but we either need to eradicate the unions and and make it a for profit enterprise, mm. and, and 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 watch how fast education goes where, 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 where private schools receive vouchers from the country. And that's where the money goes, but let people run it for profit because we're failing our kids. Um, you know, uh, I, I spoke to governor Newsom when he was Lieutenant governor happened to be friendly. And, um, and I said to the, I said, said this to him years ago when California, the state of California was, 43rd or whatever in the nation at the time, like picking the number. And I said, how much of the state budget goes to education? And I forget what the percentage was, but it's an astonishing number. Right. <clears throat> Could you effectuate the rest of your agenda if you didn't have to spend that money on, on education? Because education is, the public education system is, is failing, right? We're before, if we're 43rd, yeah. that's not working. And right. he was like, well, of course. And I was like, great. Eradicate the public school system and that. So it was unions. I'm like fuck the unions. And yeah. I grew up in a union family. Right, right, right. And but I've also heard union stories too. You know, 
from those in the union. And, and so I was, he's like, you can never run for office. I was like, no danger. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but I would, I would probably, I, I would try to revamp uh, the, the public schools. education system in this country. And I think a lot of that would go to, I would actually want to, I, when I say eradicate the unions, I actually mean, I, but I would actually pay teachers more. Yeah. Right on. I think I'd vote for that. But, um, what gives you hope and what do you fear? My kids give me hope. Nice. Um, I think young, young, young kids give me hope. Uh, the empathy that younger generations have for each other, um, I think is pretty, pretty great. Yeah. Um, there's no judgment right that's all learned jim we all learned that from adults right and i think but somehow we got we made it better and then it's getting better right yeah i love the the kid that just came out in the nfl and there's no like crazy reaction like you would have expected it to be and and nor should there be and 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 i find it like with kids younger kids it's like a whole big who cares and that's just one thing i'm talking about i just think there's more empathy and amongst younger generations and as soon as you get some of the old folks out of the way i i I think (laughs) it gives me hope right cool man all right well let's just do the speed round i'm I'm a history teacher and a psychology teacher so i'm just going to ask you i'm going to give you two things we did it with zapata so you might already know but you just say the first one that comes to your mind okay Mm -hmm. so it's just it's just an or situation okay yeah. it's like xbox or playstation you just say whatever you want yeah, yeah. you're you're definitely the triathlete that, I, that, that we didn't get to that part of it but the, oh the <laughs> fucking triathlete spending, spending the time we'll come back to that another time but, yeah uh, hopefully we can thanks, do this once a year thanks for hanging in there man here we go yeah i mean this is way longer than i asked you to be all here. right go i'll talk all bikes right. all day long let's come on and talk about bikes i'll do a whole segment on bikes right on right on <laughs> all right here we go speed round yeah uh, elvis or jerry lee elvis Beatles or Stones? Beatles. Chuck D or L Cool J? Chuck D. Ford or Chevy? I drive a Chevy Silverado. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Whiskey or tequila? Not applicable. N A. <laughs> but it would have been tequila. <laughs> you know, I always tell Chuck I'm waiting for somebody to come on here and like have a third answer for every single one. You know, Coke, Pepsi, not Dr. Pepper. You know, like tequila you know anyways yeah. uh we can, get tequila. We, can, we can say tequila android or ios <laughs> what's that android or ios ios baseball or football <sighs> i'm gonna say <laughs> football but my dream is to own the pirates oh boy they need you they need you buddy they need you <laughs> uh blonde or brunette blonde legally like, blonde yeah exactly legally duh uh, <laughs> this one is equally as uh, tough. J Lo or Selma? I, I, I just can't answer that question. You shouldn't gonna, answer. You absolutely should not answer that question. I'm pass. Out of boy. Wait, you, you don't. You didn't used to represent J Lo, did you? I did not. Just Selma. So there you go. There's your answer. There you go. All right. I what did what did the guy say last time, Coach? J Lo's collecting as many rings as Thanos. Yeah. <laughs> the greatest fucking joke i ever heard <laughs> she's collecting more rocks than thanos all right uh sorry j-lo uh batman or superman uh batman world war ii or vietnam vietnam and the last one of the speed round ben scully or chick hearn chick nice <laughs> right on. Hey, that's boy that's like sophie's choice I that is sophie's that's choice like, huh? your little time you spent in la right wow you're like I, I got one more i got one more for you Okay. Yeah. Favorite Reese Witherspoon uh, movie. Oh, mm-hmm. easy. Election. Nice. Election. <laughs> That's awesome. She's a sassy girl in that one. Good job, man. Right on. Appreciate uh, you, brother. Right. Awesome, Thank man. You. Thank you, sir. I, I, I will you, uh, hopefully look forward to getting back on and, uh, and at some point down the road and talking about bikes. That would be cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll get on there with uh, – I'll do one with uh, Miguel Medina and Luis Jaramillo and Rick uh, Zapina. We'll just chop it up there, and then, then, <laughs> then we won't leave any names We'll de- We'll definitely get some subscribers then. <laughs> we'll definitely get some subs. Good luck, good luck, Jim, with everything, and, uh, and thanks for sharing all that stuff with us. Uh, the same, uh, pass it on to your family as well. And, uh, yeah, thanks for giving us the time. With it. So thanks a lot, man. Likewise, guys. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Take care.